Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zune, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at organicuniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com forward slash contests. As we continue our special series called The Neonicotinoid View, Tom and I are going to talk to Michelle Colopy, the program director of the Pollinator Stewardship Council, about recent efforts to protect bees, and also we'll have a discussion about the recent Eastern Apiculture Society's annual conference. First, I'd like to welcome to the show Tom Theobald. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, June, from sunny Colorado. Even though it's uh, only mid-August, we're beginning to feel a touch of fall in the air. Thanks, Tom. And our guest today, Michelle Colopy. Good afternoon, Michelle. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me again. Michelle, can you share with our audience a little bit about yourself and exactly what the Pollinator Stewardship Council does? Uh, thank you. Yes. The Pollinator Stewardship Council is a nonprofit organization of beekeepers, and our mission is to defend, manage, and native pollinators from the impact of pesticides. You certainly, beekeepers do have a right to protect their bees, whether they're pollinating crops or not, if they're, even if they're just making a honey crop. They have a right to protect their bees from the impact of pesticides. From what I understand, Dr. Susan Kegley is working on some very important research. Could you share with our listeners a little bit about the project, especially since the council is working with her on this project? Thank you. Yes, the the Pollinator Stewardship Council strongly believes in collaborative projects and peer-reviewed research, and we partnered with uh, Pesticide Research Institute, which is run by Dr. Susan Kegley, to do research uh, on hives as they pollinate our crops. So we call it the Hive Tracking Project. She is following across three years. She will follow hives as they commercially pollinate our crops. So it will be a variety of crops in a variety of states, a variety of climates, so that we can analyze the true, real-world pesticide load our bees are encountering. Because we are experiencing and and finally starting to track summer losses of our honeybee colonies. And we really look at, and and the beekeepers will tell you, they, they feel these summer losses are due to the extreme pesticide load the bees are exposed to. But we need analysis of the uh, pollen and the nectar and the uh, wax within these hives to truly look at the um, scientific and the chemical analysis of what is still residing in those hives. What are the synergisms created by the mixes of pesticides, the fungicides, the herbicides, the insecticides, because this is what is causing this slow dwindling of hives over the summer so that even as bees go into the winter, they don't have enough uh, strengthen their colony to survive the winter, and they are starting to, over the winter, they just eat this toxic food that has a sublethal level of pesticides, but you eat enough of a sublethal level of something, and eventually it's lethal. But we needed that chemical composition. We need that uh, scientific analysis of all of the hive products, and this research product, uh, project will do that. Again, it's about the real-world experience of our bees, not one active ingredient at a time. It's all of the active ingredients and all of their degradates and all of the so-called inerts or other ingredients that are in these pesticides that are affecting our bees. So this is really important research that we have collaborated with the Pesticide Research Institute as well as Montana State University to do this peer-reviewed research on the real world of our bees. Thank you, Michelle. And I just want to mention 
research that was conducted by Dr. Hank Tenekis, which was focused on the dose-time ratio. And, Tom, I do believe you and I did that interview together. I think we should talk about that just briefly for our listeners that are not familiar with that research. Basically, what Dr. Tenekis found was that over a period of time, once a certain dosage had been reached, death was imminent. What they said was that the effect on the synapses is cumulative and irreversible. And it's very interesting. We've been having some discussion over the last few days about what this means because they've just released another paper. And Dr. Kegley has found that with a metacloprid, one of the neonicotinoids, that they're metabolized almost immediately, which is part of the explanation for why it's been so difficult to find the neonicotinoids in dead bees because by the time the bees are dead, those chemicals are gone. Well, the question was raised, uh, if, if, the, if the chemicals irreversibly bond to the synapses, could they be identified that way? And the answer to that after much discussion is no. But the comparison that I used was lung cancer. A person could smoke early in life, sometimes for many years, but then quit for 30 or 40 years and ultimately die of, of lung cancer. Well, if you were to examine their system, you would find no nicotine. But the nicotine is what had set that process in motion. And we're seeing a similar situation for the neonicotinoids. And they're just one of many pesticides, one of the major concerns, but they kill the bee, they disappear, they're hard to identify, and their their effect is long-lasting. So what Dr. Tenekes and others have said is that if you have a, a chronic dose, it can be a tiny, tiny dose, and you add the element of time, the end point is the same, which is death of the colony death of the bees. And this is research that has never been negated. Industry will not go near it, much less any of the so-called experts that have been writing about neonicotinoids and the fact that there is no crisis, that the bees are fine. So I find it very interesting that this is one of a number of papers, actually, that have never been negated, never been discussed, but yet the point remains, this is solid proof of the impact of these systemic pesticides. There was a national public radio program this past week, and among other things, they said what's commonly trotted out is that the number of colonies of bees in the United States is at its highest point ever. That's simply untrue, and I don't know where they get that information. Maybe Michelle can elaborate on that a little <laughs> bit, but it's been my experience that we are in deep trouble, and we certainly have not seen an increase in the number of bees, colonies of bees. Right. It's interesting. At the EAS conference, the Eastern Apicultural Society conference that I'm attending this week, they did discuss the bee numbers because even in Canada, they will tout that there are more beehives than ever. The issue becomes how we count bees. And typically, with basic math, you count one, two, three, four. But beehives don't create that way since we can take a number one, we can take one hive and split it, and now we have two. So that when a beekeeper starts out with, say, 50 hives but loses 25, they can sometimes still make 25 from the 25 remaining. So it's a, it's a mathematical counting of the bees that is not realistic of how beekeeping is done. So that we need to in some way almost have a different category of you had in the spring 50 hives, 25 died by July. Then you have another column of I made splits from the main remaining 25 so that we can, in a sense, add and subtract at the same time because it is, it's a difficult thing for your typical bean counter to understand, and especially sometimes government people, to understand how you can get two hives out of one simply because of splits. But we are, if you talk to real beekeepers, we are maintaining a status quo. I talk yeah. to commercial beekeepers, and through the course of the season, 
they may have an almost complete turnover of their population because of what you've just, just described, the splitting and dividing. So if they start if they start the season with a hundred bees or a thousand bees, and they wind up at the end of the year with nine hundred colonies, uh, it doesn't mean that their losses are ten percent. It means that their losses, more realistically, are approaching 100%. And they play with these figures. They know what's going on. They being the chemical companies and the agribusiness people, they know what's going on. They're just playing with the figures and trying to present a picture that simply is untrue. Right. Well, and it's an unrealistic number of, again, how the beekeeping industry works. So in some way, the beekeeping industry needs to work with government to say, no, this is how you need to count it. We need to change the system of how we count hives because it's unrealistic and it is actually just flat out wrong to say we are increasing the number of bees. No, we are not. So we need to come up with a better way to count that is actually realistic of the beehives and the way the industry works. At the conference, who were some of the featured speakers? Well, certainly we had a, a wonderful program last night uh, called Emerging Issues in Pollinator Health, and the main speakers were uh, Dr. Ernesto Guzman, Dr. Christian Krupke, Dr. Franco Mutinelli, Dr. Rigel Nain, uh, Rain, excuse me, Dr. Ry Nigel Rain, and it was uh, facilitated by the EAS president for this year, Andre Fleece. I believe that's Fleece. So uh, it was an interesting program. Um, the, the way EAS is structured, it has kind of different tracks. They do have for pesticides. They have things for um, some of the sideline industries of mead making and propolis uh, uses and things like that. And then they'll have intermediate and beginning beekeeping classes. So the, the discussion last night focused on emerging issues, which at times I didn't think they were so emerging. <laughs> so there were things that we all know. Um, certainly, uh, there are times, if I can be blunt, um, that I, I do wish some of the research was, would realize beekeepers are intelligent people. Beekeepers are people who read. We read research. We read. Well, there are a lot of uh, beekeepers who are scientists. And a lot of beekeepers who are scientists. So that we don't want to be talked down to. We don't want a presentation that seems to go back almost 10 years. Um, on these analysis thinking that it's aliens or cell phones causing uh, the poor health of bees. We know it isn't, and I, I do wish some researchers would stop with that. They're not talking to a group of 10-year-old children. So, um, but there were some interesting comments I know from Dr. Krupke uh, because he did a lot of research on corn in Indiana, and especially the neonic-coated uh, seeds and comparing that to uncoated seeds, which was very difficult for him as a researcher to find untreated corn seeds so that he could have a control. And it was interesting in that his studies, uh, and they did a couple of different plots. It wasn't one or two. It was about four or five, even six, across Indiana. So it was in different parts of the state. And whether it was no-till planting or not, either way, it was the dust off from the planter that contained the neonics that was causing the issues. So either way, it was still the dust off from the planter, no matter the type of contraption. And that even with the seed treatments, he, he did even look at some things with soybeans, and the way neonics are structured, it's supposed to deal with the aphids, but the seed treatment is already gone by the time aphids come out in soybeans. So the, then that seed treatment seems to just be a waste of space and causing more problems, uh, you know, off the soybean than it is there to help the soybean. Now, in, in corn, they found that they could not find any of the pests in the cornfield for the reason the neonics are supposedly used. So they couldn't find a single pest. Uh, he kind of joked that he said he, when he talks to farmers, he said, if you, if any of you have, wire worm or the corn root worm or the white grub, call me. I want to come out and see it in your field. I want to come out and figure out why it's there because they have not found it. Well, this isn't so farming. It was in, this is marketing. This, yes, this is sales it, it is about marketing. It, it was interesting, too. The, the other pesticides they found um, in uh, the field 
you know, whether it was neonics, but they also found a lot of, they, they looked at the hives then around the cornfields, and certainly our bees are encountering a lot of pesticides because it's where they forage. It was interesting that they did find mosquito abatement prog- uh, products even out in agri- um, agricultural areas, not just cities. They found mosquito abatement products out in the country and a lot of DEET. So that while people might put DEET on for themselves because it is water soluble, goes through the water table, gets into you know various streams and rivers where our bees drink. This is the one thing that I did find interesting in the presentation that since the neonics are so water soluble, certainly Dr. Krupke did say we need to look at more organisms than just bees and see how the neonics are affecting so many of the other organisms that there seems to be in one sense, too much focus on just the bees. We need to look at the other things since the neonics are so water-soluble and examine a lot of these other organisms and the effects of neonics on them as well. Well, Tom and I talked about this numerous times over the years, and the reason that there has been so much of an emphasis on honeybees is because it has a direct financial impact on agriculture, whereas other species do not. And I hate to put it in such black and white terms, but that's the bottom line. I searched high and low for research on the impact of other species, and there just was not a lot out there. I know that there has been some research done on bats and birds, but not much else as far as any other organisms that are important to good soil health. So right. that is something that needs to be done. But unfortunately, it does require money. And any scientist will tell you the money just isn't there. Now, we right. have money for all sorts of things. But when it comes to the health of our environment, there's nothing available. I mean, it's ridiculous. Right. And, well, and, and I think certainly with research dollars, like with anything, it sometimes comes down to marketing. And whatever is the cause of the day, we throw a ton of money at it. The problem is we always throw a ton of money at something in a short-term effort instead of looking at the long term. We have had these neonics in the environment for so long. We've had many of these pesticides. We don't seem to look at the and do the long-term research on it. We have it here. It should have been constantly reviewed, and maybe we would have resolved some of this a long time ago, but we do these just, you know, kind of throwing the spaghetti at the wall, whatever sticks. So it certainly is an issue, and when something is water-soluble like this, of course it's going to affect other things. One of the, the interesting things from last night's presentation is while they talk about how water-soluble neonics are, they did not seem to make enough of a connection of neonics in the water and how those could kill the bees. When a, when a colony needs a gallon and a half of water a day, they're going to be drinking neonics. So that they're getting it also in the water. It is not just from the dust off of the plants. It's not the dust blowing on other blooming crops. It is also as the dust blows on the water, as the seed deteriorates in the soil and the soil and rainwater flushes it out of the soil into streams and rivers and puddles. It is that entire system, again. It is not just the one active ingredient and how it's used. And again, it goes back to the, the hive tracking project that Dr. Kegley is working on. The real world is experience of our bees. You talked earlier about the list of speakers. I had a chance to go over the program, and there was one that really jumped out at me, and that was the name Cynthia Scott Dupree was presenting on pesticides and basic toxicology. And it puzzles me because Dr. Dupree was one of the co-authors of the, of the failed study, the life cycle study that was supposed to have cleared the way for clothianidin registration way back in 2003. And that still it was never has, published. That still no. has not been published, still has not been satisfied. They redid it to the tune of about a million dollars and we've heard nothing. Her work uh, has been generally regarded as unduly pro-chemical company and scientifically substandard. And I'm just wondering how she was selected to present on pesticides and basic toxicology when she seems to be so lacking. Why are they not focusing on the facts? Why are they not focusing on things that will help the bees? I mean, obviously they have all sorts of classes and workshops and information galore 
about how to care for your bees, so on and so forth. But when it comes to this global decline of our bees, there should be a tremendous emphasis on the science. How does that person wind up leading other beekeepers and scientists at such a large conference? I'm a little concerned about how you've described the panel that you were on. We've had an avalanche of very sophisticated research which has implicated, in this case, the neonicotinoids in huge losses globally, not just in Canada, not just in the United States. We have evidence, clear evidence, that there is no safe dose, that the effect is cumulative and irreversible, and and you ha were on a panel where you've described being talked to as if you were children. Mm -hmm. um, it, it concerns me that these supposed leading scientists are telling you about things that were four, five, six years old. I mean, what what's going on here? Well, and, and again, I think it goes back to some scientists feel that beekeepers, because they don't have a Ph.D., which from my overeducated viewpoint, and I have two master's degrees, sometimes I've had PhDs tell me it's just piled higher and deeper. It does not make you smarter than anyone else. And that I have encountered, as I'm sure you have, Tom, very smart beekeepers who don't have a PhD, but they read well, they pay attention to their bees, they talk to other people, they are good observers. And scientists must be good observers. And that's what I find uh, difficult with sometimes with that panel last night I did not feel they observed their audience well enough to realize we were smart people it's the PhDs who got us where we are yeah but you know, certainly with these regional conferences from my perspective of pollinator stewardship council I'm happy when they just talk about pesticides because far too many people have made the pesticide issue whether it's neonics, tank mixes, whichever, herbicides, fungicides, they have made it a political issue when it is not. It is a health issue of our bees, and I agree, at every beekeeping conference, we need to be discussing in a full and open manner pesticides and how they are impacting the health of our bees. We have got to get away from, in the beekeeping industry, this fear that talking about pesticides is political. Because there's one regional conference I have yet to be able to speak to it because they think we as an organization are too political simply because we are concerned about the health of our bees and the impact of pesticides upon that health of our bees. When that does not make us political, that makes us concerned. So we have got to, as regional organizations, national ones, even state beekeeping groups, they must confront this aspect of our honeybees' health directly it has nothing to do with politics. That has everything to do with keeping our bees alive, whether they're backyard bees or commercial bees. And we have a right to keep them alive and healthy. And is this particular backyard. conference sponsored by industry? By um, I do, yeah, I do not see that it was. Certainly none of the pesticide companies are there. I was quite surprised when uh, even when you drive to um, University of Gulf, you drive by Syngenta's office. So um, my understanding is they have not supported this at all. Uh, but again, I don't know if there were any other donations. There are no add in the program book, no thank yous to any of the pesticide industry. And just because it was at University of Gulf, where a number of the professors that you might have issues with their research, again, they chose this because it was the hometown of EAS as president for this year. These regional conferences typically hold their event at a local university. Michelle, what is the existing situation with the Ontario beekeeping community? How are their bees doing? Oh, their bees are not doing well at all. I talked to a number of Ontario beekeepers who are moving out of the area. They're buying farms out of the province or, or far up north in the province to get away from commercial agriculture because they cannot keep their bees alive. And it is not just from neonics, it's also from the tank mixing that happens throughout the growing season. Because you'll have production agriculture for a variety of crops growing here in the Ontario area, and they cannot keep their bees alive because the crops are constantly sprayed with insecticides and fungicides. So they are moving their bees out. Thank you. 
Michelle, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. And the same thing with you, Tom. Thanks for joining me today. Yes, thank you both. I always enjoy talking. Thank you. And folks, please check out the companion article, which will be available on theorganicview.com's website. And tune in next week as Tom and I continue exploring the impact of the world of neonicotinoids. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.